place. I like how we just said, we take our kids here after we just spent like five minutes talking about brothels. Well, <laughs> you have to be 16 or older to go on the brothel tour. <laughs> so we don't take our kids there. This is the Exploring the National Parks podcast with Dirt in My Shoes. My name is Ash, and I'm a former park ranger and the founder of Dirt in My Shoes. I think that the parks are best seen from the trail, and I'm here to make national park trip planning easy. And I'm John. I carry the kids on the trails, I tell stories, and notice all the things that Ash doesn't care about much, like birds. Join us as we show you around America's spectacular national parks. We're sharing our favorite places, fun facts, adventures, and misadventures. And we'll even throw in a little trip planning. Let's start exploring. Today, I'm really excited because if you've never been to South Dakota, today we're going to introduce you to some of my favorite places to visit in the American West, and that is the Black Hills. Oh my gosh, we spend so much time here. (laughs) We just cannot get enough. Oh my gosh. I actually, one year, when we were South Dakota locals, I lost my driver's license and we had to come back to South Dakota. And I think Ash and I were both just like, sweet. I know. (laughs) I know. We were, you lost your driver's license in Yellowstone. And so we had to drive back to South Dakota to go get a replacement. And both of us, like, we were like looking at each other going, huh, okay, cool. Like, twist my arm. I know. We're happy to go back to South Dakota. We'll go back um, into Rapid City and, and do the Black Hills again. Yes. It's so, so much fun. It's I, a favorite. Like, it is such a cool place to go with your family, too. Because oh, yeah. you don't have to spend very much time at any one place. And there's so many places to work through that guaranteed there will be something for someone in your group. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. It's like Disneyland for the American West, if you're hoping to. <laughs> because <laughs> the best thing about Disneyland is like around every turn, there's something that gets your kids' attention in a new way, right? So they never get bored. The Black Hills is like that for me. You know, oh, it's, yeah. there's so many different things. And there's places for hiking. There's places for high adventure. There's places for history and the old Wild West there, and aliens even, you know. And yeah. So- <laughs> Yeah, man. There's tons of cool stuff here. You'll never run out of things to do. Okay, so let's jump in because we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. But I do just want to mention this episode is not going to talk about Mount Rushmore. Right. Because we did a whole Mount Rushmore episode, episode 27. So if you want specific Mount Rushmore, go to that one. This is also not going to cover Badlands National Park. Right. Because we already did two episodes for Badlands. Right. um, Episodes 26 and 28. So this episode is basically just like all the other stuff that you can do in addition to Mount Rushmore and Badlands. (laughs) Yeah. So definitely if you feel like you're wanting more information on those specific places, we have you covered. But we've also, we've really, I, I can't wait to talk more broadly about this area just in general, all the different things and all the different stops, you know, we've got you covered. Yeah. So this, when we talk about the Black Hills, I mean, the Black Hills generally are right around the Rapid City area of South Dakota. Right. And so you go out of Rapid City, you kind of go to the west and south (laughs) Mm -hmm. to get to the southern Black Hills. And then you can go north and over and the Black Hills extend into Wyoming. Mm-hmm. So we're also going to we're going to jump into there a little bit, too. But that's the area we're talking about here is the area right near Rapid City. But Mount Rushmore, Badlands, all that is also right there. So let's start at the southern part of the Black Hills mm-hmm. with Wind Cave National Park, which is such a great spot. I think that it surprises a lot of people, but even still, if people visit it, sometimes I feel like they don't even explore it to its full capacity because there's so much here. Here's the thing. Most people are underwhelmed by Wind Cave. <laughs> like if if I were to do a matchup between Wind Cave and probably basically any other cave in the mm-hmm. national park system, right. it would not win. Right. We know that. Wind Cave versus a really big walk-in closet (laughs) sometimes. So Wind Cave usually is pretty underwhelming for people, but you've got to know what you're looking at because if you know what you're looking at Mm -hmm. while you're in this cave, it actually is amazing. Yes. And we've toured so many caves. 
I think we've been to basically them all that are run by the National Park Service. Right. And Wind Cave has something called box work. Mm-hmm. Box work is a formation. It looks like honeycomb. It's pretty understated. Yeah. Because it's not like a giant stalactite or stalagmite. It, it, it's nothing like that. It's not cave bacon, which is always a winner right. <laughs> with our kids. Yeah. It's just on the walls. It's not very big. Maybe like, I don't know, two inches, three it, inches out from the wall. Yeah. It's a really super fragile and super rare cave formation. But you're right. It it doesn't like jump out at you like, no. oh, that's super you're cool. You're not like, whoa, that's massive. You know, it's not like Carlsbad Caverns where it's just like, Around every turn, you're like, oh my gosh. Right. I can't believe this is here. And so that is the underwhelming part of Wind Cave, I think, is people expect big, beautiful formations in this cave. And it just doesn't happen really here Mm -hmm. because you have so much box work. Mm -hmm. And box work is incredibly rare. You can find little tiny bits of it in other caves. But this cave is literally covered in this rare formation. And so for me... I just get so excited about it because I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's not like traditionally pretty. It's not even like Jewel Cave, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's just, you know, 15 minutes down the road. It's not like that at all. And so if you go in expecting a traditional cave, Mm -hmm. you will feel disappointed probably. You have to go in knowing that you are seeing something extremely rare that you really won't find anywhere else. Right. If you haven't ever been to a cave before, you might not really appreciate it because I really can't, uh, I can't think of another place or another major cave where I've seen box work before. But if you have been to a bunch of caves before, you know, if you've been to Mammoth Cave, if you've been to Carlsbad, if you've been to Crystal Cave and Sequoia, all these other caves, there's just Tippanoga Cave. There's always like your people are excited about what they remember from like elementary school. There's stalactites, stalagmites. There's a lot of flow stone and maybe popcorn cave and formations. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and cave bacon. So there's a lot of food in caves. Yeah. <laughs> People that name stuff in caves must have been hungry. But when you, but yeah, you really have to know oh my gosh, I have never seen this before in any cave. And that when you get there, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. So let me explain what box work is really fast. And this isn't going to be like the perfect explanation because it's not completely accurate, but it'll do. So imagine. You're deep underground and deep underground, you've got layers and layers of rock that are just pressurized because there's so much weight sitting on top of them and they're pressurized into like a sedimentary rock. Well, imagine something happens like, I don't know, the tectonic plate moves or something shifts or there's a tectonic uplift, mountains are rising, something happens so that an entire layer of rock just breaks. It doesn't just break though like snaps in half. It shatters kind of like a windshield. But because there's so much weight underneath it that's firm, there's so much stuff on top of it, it shatters and then stays in place. So you have all these cracks throughout this entire layer of rock. And then what fills those cracks and those crevices? You know, whenever you watch a movie where people get stuck in caves, it's like follow the water. Somehow they always end up following water to safety and they get out. Well, water fills in those cracks, but it's not just water most of the time, and especially here at Wind Cave, because a lot of the layers around it, or even the layer itself, could be limestone. And limestone, when it interacts with water, it often dissolves in the water. And so basically what you'll have, the water becomes almost like a really milky cream soda in a lot of ways. And that milky cream soda fills in all these newly created cracks in the shattered layer of rock. And then over millions of years, that milky cream soda kind of crystallizes and turns into something hard. And then over time, all of the rocks around that crystallized cream soda dissolve away into a cave. And then all you're left with is this really cool honeycomb Basically, it looks like cardboard honeycombs of box work, which is left. And it really is as fragile as it sounds, where yeah. it's just like crystallized cream soda. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think that's a great way to put it. Like the shattered windshield and, uh-huh. and, and it just fills it in. And so you get all these really cool patterns of box work all over the cave. What I think is cool about Wind Cave is that 
not only does it have a very strong Native American history, they knew it was there. They have legends around it, which are just fantastic. Yes. Which we won't have time to go in, but it definitely makes it even cooler. Right. <laughs> learning those. What else I think is really cool is that this cave was actually the very first cave to become a national park. That is so neat. So it was established in 1903, and it really was a trendsetter for caves <laughs> because they hadn't protected a cave before. Right. Not even Mammoth Cave, which was much further east and yeah. way more used by people. Yeah. So Wind Cave became a national park very early on. I think it was national park like number six. Which is nuts. It was really early, but it was also the very first cave that they ever thought to protect as a national park. So I thought that was really cool. The other thing is this cave actually is one of the longest and most complex caves in the world. Right. So it's nothing to poo-poo about <laughs> just because it's full of boxwork and not stalactites, but it's 150 miles long. And so that's, I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's nothing compared to Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave is still the king of caves. Which is over 400 miles long. Yeah. But um, Carlsbad Caverns is slightly smaller than Wind Cave. Mm -hmm. So that just kind of gives you a scope if you've been to those other caves. But Wind Cave is long and it is complex. So right. it's very impressive. You just have to go in with the right set of expectations so that you can really appreciate what you're seeing. Right. Okay, so if you're wanting to see Wind Cave, you do have to take a ranger guided tour. You can get tickets on recreation.gov in advance, which I highly recommend because mm -hmm. it does sell out. But you can sometimes get last minute ones at the visitor center too. To tour the cave is the main thing to do here. So definitely if you're hoping to go down there and see Wind Cave, make sure you get online and get those reservations in advance so that you can actually see the cave when you get there. Right. One of my favorite things about Wind Cave, though, doesn't actually have much to do with the cave itself. I actually love exploring or at least driving on some of the roads on the top of the earth, you know, above Wind Cave. It's got amazing amounts of wildlife and it is so pretty above ground because you've got all the classic Western wildlife. You've got buffalo, you've got pronghorn, you know, you've got elk that you can see. There's tons of wildlife that you can see as you drive around Wind Cave above ground. It's super neat. It reminds me of the Chronicles of Narnia, the sixth book, The Silver Chair, where the Narnians are basically existing and they don't even know that there's a whole world underneath them of cave people you know where they're heated by the center of the earth you know and they they grow rubies and they eat them because they're juicy and stuff like that you know it's kind of crazy you got narnians like buffalo up top and you've got the cave down below wind cave is the chronicles of narnia book six it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really like uh the rankin ridge trail i actually i hiked that one without you i do i uh, remember that and i got stuck there was a massive buffalo on the trail and he was not having it. <laughs> he was not moving. And <laughs> so we, it's a loop trail. It's not very long. It's a mile long. So I was hiking with my brother. We got stuck by this buffalo who would not move. And it was just he, it was just himself. Right. He was just king of the trail. That That's day. all that it needs to be. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we got there and we ended up having to turn around and go around the rest of the loop to get up to the top. And anyway, <laughs> I was kind of bugged. But at the same time, it was like, I just like got turned down by a buffalo. Yep. He was not moving. <laughs> you so played chicken with a buffalo I, and you lost. <laughs> I lost. So, But that trail is really beautiful. I love that trail. You can also, if you drive down to the southern part of the park, you'll get down to Bison Flats. Mm -hmm. uh, we often see buffalo out there. You really will see them anywhere, right. though. I mean, it's not like you have to go to one certain spot. Exactly. There's a pretty good chance you'll they see roam. them. They roam. Yeah. The Prairie Vista Trail, which is right behind the visitor center, that one is really pretty. You're walking through the grasses mm -hmm. uh, with really nice views. And then I really love, there's a couple of backcountry roads they're dirt roads that take you out of the north part of Wind Cave and up into Custer State Park. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the NP5 and 6 roads. We have seen tons of buffalo back there, too. Yeah, tons of them. And it's, In herds. it's beautiful and it's quiet. So yeah. we love driving those. Wind Cave, I mean, you don't need really more than a day here. 
but it's it's a day well spent. Yes, absolutely. Great way to start your Black Hills road trip. Yeah, and if you want to drop down into Hot Springs, which is right below, it's the town right next to Wind Cave, then you can go to the Mammoth site while you're there, and that's really cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, the Mammoth site. That's one of my favorite places in the Black Hills. It's so So cool, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it during this episode because we got so much ground to cover. But the Mammoth site is amazing because there's a guy in 1974, he was doing some work in the area and he found a tusk. On further inspection of the area, they realized, holy cow, this place is special. And over the years, they've found over 60 mammoths and not just like woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoths are super cool, but they found like 58 Colombian mammoths, as well as like a whole bunch of other Ice Age animals. And the Colombian mammoths, what I love about them, they're incredibly huge. Like at the shoulder, which is where they measure their height, they're like 13 feet tall and they can weigh over like 22,000 pounds. And they found just tons of these creatures at this mammoth site. And so it's an incredible place to experience. And you can see all these things. They they haven't dug them all completely out. It's still a working research facility. You can still see people in there digging them out. Yeah. So it's really cool. It's fun to watch. <laughs> Our kids love love it too. Yeah, it's really fun. So that's a cool option if you're down there by Wind Cave. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think moving north. So as you go north of Wind Cave, you'll hit Custer, the town. Right. And so if you're wanting to stay in the southern Black Hills, um, Custer, you can access Custer State Park really easily from there down to Wind Cave. Jewel Cave is right there. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned Jewel Cave a few minutes ago. Talking about Wind Cave, where if you do both caves while you're here, you will see that they are not the same at all. Right. They don't look similar like at all. No, they're so different, and which is why I would probably recommend, I don't know if you would have the same opinion as me, but I would recommend if you've never been to a cave before and you want to see some of the more traditional cave stuff, maybe Jewel Cave is the right one. But if you've been to a bunch before and you want to see box work, that's why you go to Wind Cave. I would choose Wind Cave over Jewel Cave just because I love the novelty of the box work. Right. But Jewel Cave is really pretty. It's a national monument, so it is run by the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. This cave is the third longest cave in the world. It's 200 miles long. It's crazy. So, I mean, it's very long. It has the traditional formations that you're used to seeing in caves or hearing about in caves. So if you're wanting more of that type of an experience, then Jewel Cave is really good. You can take the scenic tour. Again, it's ranger ranger guided, so you do need to sign up and get your tickets in advance. But that one definitely is worthwhile as well. Yeah, you'll find Jewel Cave right outside of Custer. We like Custer. We, we'll go in and souvenir shop. John has to stop at every knife store in the Black Hills. <laughs> I love knives. He loves buying They're knives. They're so cool. Like, and they have some really cool ones. You know, they have like those ones that are made out of... Antler antlers. bones. Yeah. <laughs> antlers are bones. And there's so many different things that you can do with knives. Yeah. Oh. So we will souvenir shop in Custer. Um, we've also, we've stayed there a few times if we're focusing more on the, the southern part of the Black Hills. But also we go to the pie place. Mm-hmm. That the was purple, good. It's called the purple pie place. They have chicken pot pie, which I love. <laughs> and then they have strawberry rhubarb pie, which is... Oh, to die for. That's just my favorite kind of pie in general. Yeah, so I love anytime strawberry anyone, rhubarb. <laughs> anytime anyone has strawberry rhubarb, I'm like, oh, I'm so there. We um, tried to grow rhubarb in our garden last year just so that we could try to make strawberry rhubarb pie, but they didn't grow. Nah. Darn but it. I was looking at the menu. This sounds way up your alley. This would not be anything I would like. But um, they have a raspberry rhubarb jalapeno. Ooh. I don't pie? know. Pie. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting in a dessert, a spicy dessert. Kind of like how uh, a lot of Mexican desserts are a little bit spicy, kind of mixed in with some chile. Yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah, I, I saw that and I was like, oh, that's got John written all over it. But I think the best thing about that would be that I would be able to eat it and keep it all to myself. Yeah. <laughs> because I know none of my kids or my wife would eat it. <laughs> uh that's always your plan isn't it he (laughs) orders as spicy as possible so no one eats his food Uh, (laughs) it works (laughs) okay so moving on as you go out of custer if you head west you'll end up in custer state park and this state park is a really big deal in this area yeah i think a lot of people 
actually specifically come to the Black Hills to see Mount Rushmore and Custer State Park. Mm -hmm. So Custer State Park is South Dakota's first and largest state park. It was established in 1919. So it's been a state park for a long time. It is big. You know, you could easily spend a few days in here. There's a lot of camping options. They've got some really nice lodging options, uh, some bigger... Like the state game lodge is really cool. It's it's really pretty, kind of those almost park architecture style yeah. lodging. And so you've got options for staying here for for a few nights if you want to. But then there's also a lot of scenic drives you can take, a lot of hiking. So we really like if you go to the southern part of Custer State Park, that's known as the Wildlife Loop Road. Mm-hmm. So that's where Custer State Park meets up with Wind Cave. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's tons of buffalo down there. That's where they do the buffalo roundup. Yeah, I was waiting to talk about yeah. that. <laughs> so I knew you'd be excited. But last time we were there, we weren't there for the roundup because they do that late September. We just barely missed it. Yeah. And so we got there after they had actually rounded up all of the buffalo and they had them in a lot of these. They had these, them in pens. Th- yeah. They and were so, keeping them in like holding pens. Yeah, exactly. And it was super interesting because you get to watch all of these South Dakota cowboys, you know, basically they're sorting all of the animals. They're doing medical checkups on all the animals and giving them shots and things like that and testings and everything like that. Were they doing any branding or anything? They did do some branding too. I was thinking we saw that too. It's snowing. We're out there in our coats, like freezing our butts (laughs) off. Well, it was amazing (laughs) because I have cousins that are dairy farmers and I've seen them, you know, put their animals in the chute basically. Uh And that they, they close like this little door that kind of holds the animal's head in place so that they can do the branding and do the medicine and everything without the animal getting hurt. And the people are safe too from the animal kicking and things like that. I have never seen a buffalo. I've never seen any animal look that big in a shoot before. Yeah, I feel like that'd be super scary. It was crazy. I was just watching these cowboys like closing this gate on the head of the animal. And I was like, I don't know if that's going to hold, man. (laughs) And so you've got these giant buffalo. They were so tough. They're getting branded. They're not happy. And so these cowboys and cowgirls are just working as fast as they can. And then when they open it, that buffalo just takes off. (laughs) And it is just, it is raw power up close. And it's awesome because you get to, as a spectator, you get to be really close. And you get to see these animals way closer than is ever safe in the wild. Yeah. And so it was a really unique experience seeing wild buffalo that do not want to be anywhere close to humans that close getting taken care of it it was really awesome and you get to hear the noises that buffalo make because when you watch dances with wolves or when you watch any other movie that have buffalo in it you hear the thundering noises of the hooves but you don't really hear the noises that they make like when they're just communicating you know i think a lot of times we think oh they just moo like cows it is nothing nah, like a it's cow a noise. Mad cow. <laughs> so, it's so, but it's so cool. You get to see so many animals. It's a herd of over like thirteen hundred buffalo that they round up, and so you get to see a massive amount of buffalo, kind of how they would roam the plains naturally. Yeah. So if you're there around the buffalo roundup or just after, then definitely stop at the corrals and see what you can see. If not, if you're there any other time, a lot of times you will see these buffalo just roaming through the the park, especially down in this southern area. You'll also see pronghorn. There's feral burrows that they <laughs> released in to the park. <laughs> right. They used to use them for hiking, for getting people up the trails, and then they just like released them. And so they're just out there. <laughs> Um, so you'll too, see those. I'm sick of dragging you around. So yeah. You let him go. <laughs> you'll see elk. We've seen bighorn sheep. You'll see all sorts of stuff all over the park, but specifically this wildlife loop road. There's also mountain goats. And did you know where those came from? Canada. They were brought, I think, into Custer State Park as like a gift from Canada or something like that. And they escaped. And now there's like a, <laughs> a population of mountain goats that aren't actually supposed to be here. Oh, my gosh. There is a lot of wildlife in that park. I love going and just seeing what we can see. And then there's a couple of other scenic drives that you'll really want to do while you're here at Custer State Park. And the first one is the Needles Highway. And this is the northwestern part of Custer State Park. And so you're driving along this highway. You'll pass by Sylvan Lake, Mm -hmm. which is it's a beautiful lake surrounded by granite. You can swim here. You can canoe it and paddleboard here. 
There's a campground. It's a really cool area. This is also the lake that was in National Treasure 2 that is not <laughs> behind Mount Rushmore. It's, nope. It's over here in Custer State Park. You can uh, surrender your hand and find the entrance to the yeah. secret passageway. <laughs> it is fun to see it in the movie, though, because it's like, <laughs> oh, I've been there. That's a pretty lake. Uh, but then you keep driving and further along the Needles Highway, then you get you're surrounded by like these massive rock spires. Yeah, they like shoot up they all do. around you. They look really cool. But then road gets really narrow. You're like going through this really small, narrow passageway between these spires. And other um, people's cars yeah. <laughs> and things like that. In our truck, it was super tight. Yeah. And so I was you sigh, like on Groundhog Day, just side of your eye, just side of your eye. You know, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to watch. I don't think I ever watched my mirrors that closely. Yeah. It could take a smaller car maybe. <laughs> Yes. But uh, yeah, you drive through these spires and it's really pretty. And then out the northeastern part of Custer State Park, you'll see the Iron Mountain Road. This road is really cool. It was designed to make you drive slow. That was the whole <laughs> point of it is just that you're not like cruising through the Black Hills. Right. You're driving slowly and enjoying the scenery. Right. So it has 314 curves, Ugh. 14 switchbacks. But the coolest thing about it is that there are three tunnels that perfectly frame Mount Rushmore as you're driving. And so you have like Mount Rushmore that you can see through the tunnel. Just, oh, it's so cool. Yes. So we love driving this one. You've got to drive it from the southern end up to the northern end if you want to see Mount Rushmore through the tunnels as you're driving. <laughs> so Otherwise, you'll just be so disappointed. They said we were going to see Mount Rushmore on this drive. Yeah, it will be behind you the whole time <laughs> if you go the other way. So this road connects Custer State Park up to Mount Rushmore in the Keystone area. So it's a really cool drive to do if you want to see Mount Rushmore in a different way and you want to enjoy the beautiful scenery of the Black Hills. Hey, friend, I am just interrupting this episode real quick to let you know that you can get a fully planned out hour by hour itinerary for this national park on dirtinmyshoes.com. Maybe you're feeling a little overwhelmed by all the ins and outs of the trip planning process, or you might have a fear of missing out on all the best sites and activities in the park. You've probably also heard the horror stories about how busy this park gets and are hoping to actually find some solitude while you're there. Friend, with a Dirt in My Shoes itinerary, all you have to do is show up at the park and follow the schedule. It's exactly what I would do if I was with you. You won't have to fight for a parking space, and you won't have to worry about missing out on anything cool. And on top of all of that, you'll always have the most up-to-date information. I keep your itinerary updated in real time, so you'll know all about what's happening in the park when you go. This is super helpful because what if an activity or a road is closed for construction? I'll provide you alternative options for that. Maybe extra reservations are needed to enter certain areas of the park. That can be so stressful, but I will help you snatch up those hard-to-get reservations. And what if Mother Nature strikes, which she really always does, with a major weather event like wildfires or flooding. I'll make sure you can easily navigate through those changes while still filling your days with fun and adventure. I am here for you every step of the way. You'll find a link to the itinerary in today's show notes, or you can go to dirtinmyshoes.com to find all of the available itineraries. It's time for an epic national park vacation, and I can't wait to see you out on the trail. The last thing that I want to talk about kind of more in the southern area is the Crazy Horse Memorial. Yes, which is so cool and will eventually be the largest sculpture in the world. Yes, eventually. <laughs> uh, so this is basically the Lakota people that have always considered the Black Hills to be very sacred. They want a giant sculpture of Crazy Horse. Yeah. Similar to Mount Rushmore, but it's their legacy and their history that's being displayed. Right. And so you've got this just massive rock carving of Crazy Horse, the Lakota warrior 
who is so cool. He's by the amazing. Way. Yes. But um, yeah, so it's going to be his head with like his hair flowing back and his horse mm-hmm. and his horse looks mm, like just really mean. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's so cool because his arm is going to be kind of outstretched, kind of like the guys in Lord of the Rings, the giant as the fellowship goes down the river and they're entering Gondor and you have those giant guys on both of the sides of the river with their arms that's outstretched. That's what Crazy Horse is kind of kind of look like. Yeah. Like he's like, look at how beautiful the Black Hills are. Yeah. <laughs> he's pointing to how beautiful they are. But this sculpture, so the first blast to start this was in June of 1948. Mm-hmm. And it's still not even close to being done. No, they've basically got his head done. Yeah. And it looks really cool. We like going here because your entrance fee helps them get closer to being able to finish. The reason it's taking so long is because it's completely privately funded. They are not accepting any government funding or anything for this. And so they want to do it on their own. They've got like, it's cool too, because here they have like a campus for Native American students to come Mm -hmm. and take some classes and stuff. And so it is more of like a celebration of the Lakota people and trying to help them out and having this big, beautiful memorial for them. Yeah, but the museum at the visitor center there is super interesting. They have a lot of really cool displays, but there's also a restaurant there that we got the Indian taco at that was really good. Yeah, it is good. What I think is interesting, too, is actually the sculptor who started this, and he was recruited by the chief of the Lakota people at the time. His name was Korczak (laughs) Zielkowski. I am so sorry that I (laughs) probably butchered that. But um, he you have was, to say it a little bit like this. Yeah, he was the assistant. He was an assistant to Guts and Borglum, who did Mount Rushmore. Oh, cool. So he did work with Guts and Borglum, and he, I thought it was interesting too. He loved this area and the Lakota people so much. He actually built himself a tomb at the base of Crazy Horse, Whoa. and he's buried there. So. Wow. Yeah. That's so pretty it's pretty cool. cool. But um, you'll see it from the highway. But if you've got an extra hour or two, pop in there, support the cause, you know, help them get closer to building or finishing this. But we we always love to stop here because it's massive. It is bigger than Mount Rushmore. And mm-hmm. it's just it's it's really cool. Right. And if you want to go like at the around the same time as the Buffalo Roundup that they have in Custer, they do something really cool at the Crazy Horse Memorial. It's called the Volks March. And so basically what it is, it's the largest organized hike in the USA. Oh, and really? Yeah. And so what you can do is you'll hike from the basically the Welcome Center parking area and you'll hike all the way up to the top of Crazy Horse. You turn around while you're on his arm and then you hike all the way back down. That's cool. <laughs> it's like six miles or something like that. And you cover all that elevation. But I think the record that they've had that come to this Volks March is like 15,000 people wow. that come and all hike it around the same time. And That's it, it's, cool. <laughs> it's super fun. It's usually late September, early October. And, you know, they do it in conjunction with the Buffalo Roundup. And it, it's it's really cool. That's awesome. We'll have to do that sometime. Mm -hmm. When you keep going north on the highway from Crazy Horse, that's when you'll hit both of the towns that kind of surround Mount Rushmore. So you've got Hill City on the west side and Keystone on the east side of Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. And we typically don't spend a ton of time in the towns, except to souvenir shop and eat. (laughs) Yes. But I did want to mention, so Keystone, which is the town that's just right outside of Mount Rushmore. It's fun. It's It's got like its main boardwalk area with shops and stuff down mm-hmm. in the downtown area. We have had a hard time finding like somewhere that we really love eating right. in this town. <laughs> We've eaten at Ruby's, which is a fun old time restaurant there. They have a couple of more saloon type restaurants that are really fun for the ambiance, but I feel like the food... I don't know. I haven't been impressed yet. Right. But if you just want the ambiance, then go for it because it's a really fun little downtown area. There's like some adventure parks around there, mini golf, stuff like that that you can do in Keystone as well. Mm -hmm. The other place that you might stay if you're visiting Mount Rushmore is Hill City. Uh, And Hill City is like the fancier side of Mount Rushmore. (laughs) (laughs) So when you get over to Hill City... You'll find a few wineries, 
uh, you have more of that type of stuff. Right. So there's some nicer restaurants. Uh, the restaurants over there are way better, I think, actually. You've got the Alpine restaurant, which has authentic German food. Um, so that's really fun. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, you've got like more wineries and stuff in that area. So they are different. It just kind of depends on what you want when you're staying here in the northern part of these Black Hills. What's really cool is there's a steam train that goes in between Hill City and Keystone. Right. And so that's fun, too, if you're looking for an extra activity for your kids. It's a full steam train. You know, it's steaming. Right. (laughs) So um, that will go between the two towns. A throwback to the Old West. Yeah. That's how you came out to to South Dakota. Yeah. (laughs) So um, this area is just really fun. Again, there's so much to do, but we're moving on. We're moving on. Further north. So after that, you know, you kind of go out. You can go out to Rapid City and there's all sorts of stuff to do in Rapid City, but we're not really going to hit that. What we do want to talk about, though, is one of our favorite towns in the Black Hills. Sturgis. No. (laughs) Why would that be your favorite town? Tell us. (laughs) I don't know. Because I love motorcycles. They're so cool. My uncle has gone to Sturgis over the years many times. And there's just so many cool things, so many cool bikers. And when you're in Yellowstone, you know when Sturgis just let out too. Oh, yeah. Don't go to the Black Hills during Sturgis if you want like good prices and no crowds. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Because (laughs) Sturgis is in August. Right. Like the beginning. I think it's the second week of August. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's when all of the motorcycles just descend on the Black Hills. And then you'll see after Sturgis is over, it will kind of trickle out to (laughs) Yellowstone and (laughs) Grand Teton and Rocky Mountain, you know, all these Mm -hmm. other national parks that are kind of close. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So many Harleys and leather everywhere, headbands. It's awesome. Well, and it's funny because when you drive through Sturgis, when it's not Sturgis, there's all sorts of like pop. It's almost like pop up campgrounds Mm -hmm. that are just totally empty the rest (laughs) of the year. But they make all of their money during Sturgis. (laughs) Oh, yeah. You'll drive past tons of fields that have all of these little RV poles. poles. You're just like. Why are there so they are they farming RV poles? Yeah, but no, it all fills up during Sturgis. Yeah. Every field is full of RVs with their motorcycles and their toy haulers and everything. <laughs> Sturgis is a phenomenon that just hits this place every year during the summer and it's awesome. Yeah, so go or don't go, depending on your <laughs> preference uh, during that time in August. No, I can't believe you said Sturgis. What's your favorite <laughs> town in the Black Hills? Deadwood. Deadwood. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Let's Deadwood. talk about Deadwood. Deadwood is so cool. Deadwood is, there's all these phrases that are holdovers from the Old West, like get out of Dodge or or something along those lines where, uh, or I'll be your huckleberry, kind of that, those kind of phrases that are holdovers from the Old West. They're still alive and well in Deadwood, man. It, it's, it's well, awesome. Well, they have their own that came out of Deadwood. Which one? The uh, Dead Man's Hand. Oh, that's right. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I didn't think about that. Yeah, that one came straight out of Deadwood. But basically, Deadwood is an old West town. It was started in 1876 when prospectors came. They found a gulch that was just full of gold right? <laughs> up here at Deadwood. And so this town just basically popped up overnight, which yeah. is pretty typical during the gold rush you know, in the area and oh, yeah. elsewhere. Somebody gets a whiff. Somebody gets like a, a sniff of gold and like suddenly there's all of these buildings. It's so amazing. they have their like really fun Main Street area that's all these old historic buildings from this time of just the gold rush and and everything that brought people out here to the Black Hills. So it's really fun. The coolest part of Deadwood is that Wild Bill Hickok Mm -hmm. was gunned down here. This is where he died. And he died playing poker. Yep. And he had a handful of aces and eights. Yep. The dead man's hand. And that's the dead man's hand. Because he got (laughs) shot. I think he got shot in the back, right? Back back of the head, basically. He was... It's a really interesting story. But what suit? What suit of dead man's hand? What suit of the aces? I have no idea. All black. All Uh. black. So... You got the spades and the clubs. So, but the, I don't play enough poker. I try, <laughs> but I, I'll never, I'll never be good at it. Oh man! But yeah, Wild Bill Hickok—he's a typical like folk hero of the old west, where 
You know, he came out from the East. He was a Civil War veteran. You know, he did lots of different frontier jobs. Like he was a soldier. He was a scout. He was a lawman. And like a lot of Old West stories, depending on where they lived, a lot of times they were on different sides of the law. Yeah. <laughs> Which side was he on this time? Do uh, we know? <laughs> I think he was more of a gambler. Yeah. A gunslinger. He, well, than... they said he was only in Deadwood for a few weeks. Before yeah. he was murdered. Well, he so. told his buddy, he's like, I think I'm going to die here. I think if I told my buddy that, I would just get out of Dodge. Yeah. You know, but he hung around and he was gambling quite a bit. And there was on one of these days where he was gambling, he was gambling with a guy named Jack McCall. And Jack McCall had a really bad night or a really bad morning or something like that, whenever they were playing. And Wild Bill said, hey, man, you probably should drop out of the game until you can pay, you know, what you owe. And the, as the story goes, he offered to buy him a meal. And then he came back the next day, super ticked off at Wild Bill. And Wild Bill, normally, he likes to sit so he can face the door because he's a he's like he's a folk hero he knows lots of people like him he's and seen if, a lot of people get shot probably. yeah and if, if you've seen like john wayne's the shootest there's basically if you're known as a gunman you build your reputation in the old west by gunning down other gunmen and so it, it, a lot of people would try to shoot you down to build up their own reputation they would try to kill you just for a reputation and so he always liked to sit facing the door. Well, this particular game, the people that were playing wouldn't move so that he could sit facing the door. And so he sat with his back facing the door. Rookie and mistake. Rookie mistake. And Jack comes in super ticked and just caps him. And he's gone and he books it. They chase him down and end up catching him. But that's how Wild Bill Hickok ended his days. Yeah. Aces and eights. They're in Deadwood. And so yep. Deadwood now today, actually, gambling is legal. Yep. So there's casinos. John likes to play. Blackjack. Blackjack. <laughs> I won 75 bucks last time we were there. <laughs> I was pretty pumped. Yeah. <laughs> so there is gambling. What we like to do. So if you're looking for a more family-friendly experience in Deadwood, <laughs> they do shoot out reenactments. Uh-huh. And they actually, like, they tell the story of Wild Bill also. So right. you can either see just like regular shootouts kind of specific to the Deadwood area, or you can follow the story of Wild Bill throughout the afternoon. They move these reenactments all over town. Right. So you can just kind of follow them around, you know, every hour or so they've got something going on, which is really fun. You can also go up to the Mount Moriah Cemetery, which has the tomb of wild bill and calamity jane right they're both there right next to each other so if you're really into that old west history then you can stop up there you can go see their tombs which it is was, really cool it is so fun our kids they loved the shootouts but i really liked getting serenaded by calamity jane and yeah. a couple of a couple of gamblers they had like a music hour where they were just playing old Western music, yeah. like all these reenactors. It was really fun. Well, what's fun is a lot of these activities or a lot of these performances move you around town. And so you get to visit a lot of these older historic buildings and a lot of the performances are kind of in a back room and things like that. And so you get to see a lot of the town and explore it and just kind of get immersed in the moment, yeah. you know, back in the 1800s, you know, when the West was still wild and untamed. Jeez, it was just a cool, crazy time. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy time. You feel a little crazy while you're there, too. <laughs> Speaking of crazy, so I was looking at stuff for Deadwood. We go every few years, actually. We just, we love visiting this area, but they have a new tour. And I thought it was really interesting <laughs> because this new tour, they actually let you tour a brothel. And, okay. you know, whether that's your cup of tea or not, whether you're like interested in that <laughs> or not, I thought it was really interesting because it said that that industry actually existed in Deadwood from 1876, the birthplace of the town. You know, they they put up a house and then they put up a brothel. Whoa. Um, <laughs> Roxy. Yeah. But the brothels actually ran in Deadwood until 1980. <laughs> 1980. Whoa. Yeah. And so it said that actually the last of the houses were raided and closed in 1980. And now you can tour. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, really crazy. I mean, that's that not gives, that long ago. It's not that long ago. It just gives you a like good indication of kind of 
how it feels a little bit more Wild West still yeah. in Deadwood. You know, the town you- is a maverick, man. We're doing yeah. it how we want to do it. <laughs> I know. They said they like paid off the lawmen forever <laughs> just to keep these running. And anyway. Well, didn't so- we? We ate dinner in one of those brothels too, didn't, didn't Did we? Did we? Uh, we've eaten dinner. So we like saloon number 10. And that's where they do the reenactment of Wild Bill getting shot. Mm-hmm. So that's really fun. I don't remember eating in an actual brothel. We've eaten in the the social club. Which Maybe is that's really what it was. good. I don't know if that I don't Was that the that one that was. had the wild boar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was good. Yeah. So there's some good restaurants there. You walk around town, you can gamble if you want. You don't have to. We take our kids all the time and they love the reenactments and just seeing all the old stuff. And there's lots of stores you can go into and Go up to the cemetery. It's a really fun place. I like how we just said, we take our kids here after we just spent like five minutes talking about brothels. Well, <laughs> you have to be 16 or older to go on the brothel tour. <laughs> so we don't take our kids there. But yeah, so that's Deadwood. And if you want to get a taste of the Old West, you've got to stop there. Right. So the other thing that's right there in that area is Spearfish Canyon. And so if you're looking for more of a natural experience, you want to be out in nature, you can drive Spearfish Canyon. This is like a narrow gorge with thousand foot walls. There's lots of waterfalls in here. You can go to Rough Lock Falls, you can go to Bridal Veil Falls. So if you're looking for more of like a hiking experience and you want to be out in nature, then Spearfish Canyon isn't too far from Deadwood either. So that kind of rounds out like the northern part of the South Dakota Black Hills. Mm -hmm. We'll typically, on our trips, we'll typically stay basically in between those areas from Wind Cave down south up to Deadwood up north. But then if you really want to add some excitement to your trip, you head into Wyoming from there. It's about an hour and a half from Rapid City. You drive through the Wyoming Black Hills and then you will get to Devil's Tower National Monument. It is out of this world. We love Devil's Tower. (laughs) Devil's Tower is the first national monument ever created in America. Um, It was created by Teddy Roosevelt with the Antiquities Act. It was actually like he, 1906, it was like, boom. Right. (laughs) National monument. Oh, so cool. And it's such a spectacular location. Like the pictures don't even do it justice. I don't know. It just, it really does stand out in the scenery as much as, you think it does like the the best pictures are possible it stands out like a sore thumb it's so tall it's so unique and i don't know it's just such a cool feature it's so otherworldly it looks otherworldly and i think that's why they filmed close encounters of the third kind there yeah. because it it really does look like this is the symbol where the aliens should come yeah <laughs> basically a landing pad for the ufos <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> yeah but it's so cool and ash knows the tune by heart da 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 no nope. <laughs> i can't do it <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> so good. oh my gosh i was practicing yesterday and i totally choked i <laughs> forgot how it goes yes but yeah that movie is funny i, yeah. I like that movie the ending part lasts forever oh my gosh when the aliens actually show up (laughs) and they're playing that tune over and over it's like 30 minutes of do 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 no dang it do 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 well yeah i think so do 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 yes something like that you basically just have like all these (laughs) secret agents you know just basically standing there as this music plays for 30 minutes yeah as you're like I'm pretty sure the aliens would have unloaded it by now <laughs> and they would have been like, so hello, have, yeah. how, do you have any Grey Poupon? You would have been abducted by then. So <laughs> yes. that movie was filmed here. That's really where Devil's Tower gets its fame. Right. <laughs> you can actually, so the KOA that's right at the base of Devil's Tower, they filmed a lot of the movie right there and they show the movie nightly mm-hmm. from the KOA outside. It's really fun. So that's a little piece of pop culture. If you're looking for that type of experience at Devil's Tower. Yes. Last time that we were there and I was watching the film and you didn't want to do it again. Or so you were in the trailer <laughs> with the kids and I was just like myself. It was fun. I was like watching the movie by myself because it was like going to rain or something like that. And so I'm just like watching third Close Encounters of the Third Kind as there's like thunder in the distance. And I'm really thinking to myself. They're coming. <laughs> Exactly. You're just waiting. Exactly. This isn't 
people outside during a thunderstorm alone yeah this is watching an alien this is when it happened (laughs) (laughs) this is when it's gonna happen (laughs) but really what devil's tower i mean it's an 867 foot tall tower yeah just in the middle of the black hills it sticks out so far it's beautiful this area is really sacred to the native people so as you're walking around devil's tower if you take the tower trail around the base of the tower, you'll see lots of prayer bundles mm-hmm. tied into the trees. These are from the native people of the area who still come here to to worship. And so that's really cool. But it's pretty small. There's not a ton of stuff to do here. We like to do the tower trail. Uh, we like to go to the prairie dog town. That's always a favorite to see the prairie dogs. Uh, my favorite trail there is the Joiner Ridge Trail which a lot of people don't know about. It's typically pretty quiet. Yeah. Uh, It's a one and a half mile loop. You gain about 200 feet of elevation, so it's not too bad, but you have amazing views of the tower from there. Right, and the parking lot for that trail is where the landing strip for the aliens are supposed to be. (laughs) And so so it's it's a great place to spend some time. But no, I love that trail. And I I love the Native American story about the origins of Devil's Tower. It's so cool. In a nutshell, basically, there was a giant bear and there was a Native American girl and she was running away from this giant bear. And don't remember exactly if she had if she like said a prayer or like called out for help or something like that. But suddenly the ground like underneath her raised up a giant tower underneath her to save her from this bear, this massive giant bear. And then this giant bear starts to claw away at the tower or claw away at the the rock pillar that just appeared in front of it trying to get at this girl. And the devil's tower, like it actually looks like a bear's claws had just carved away at the sides of the tower. It's so cool. Yeah, it is. And the Native American history in this area is just so cool. So definitely can go to the Circle of of Sacred Smoke, which is memorial basically to the the native people who consider this area sacred mm-hmm. uh, but then yeah you'll see those those prayer bundles and those prayer rolls as you hike around so it's got a really cool feeling besides just being where the aliens land you know <laughs> there's other stuff going on that just makes it really cool so we usually try to hit devil's tower either on our way into rapid city or on our way out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of times we won't actually day trip there from Rapid City, but if you're going to Yellowstone or if you're coming from the West to come over to this area of the country, then you can take a little detour and go hit Devil's Tower and you won't be sorry. It's no. incredible. Oh, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. And whether it's the beginning or the end of your trip, it's the perfect beginning or the perfect end. Yeah. It's so awesome. Yeah, you won't be disappointed. It's definitely worth the detour to get out there. That basically rounds out, I mean, really quickly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel like I have a ton more I can say about all these stops. But I mean, those are our favorite things to do in the Black Hills. It will give you a really well-rounded experience as you're in this area. If you're trying to go to Mount Rushmore, you know, and and Badlands, Wind Cave, but then add in like all these other really cool things that you can do. You'll still have a fun natural experience, but you'll get to get a little bit deeper into the history and just the culture of the area, which is really cool. So definitely plan a lot of time here and try to hit as many stops as you can. And if you need any help planning your trip to this awesome area of the country, we're here for you. We have an itinerary that will help you explore a lot of the Black Hills here. It'll take you from stop to stop, help you figure out you know, how much time you need to spend where, and it will help you feel like you came away from this area, like blown away. And so we're here for you. We want to help you have a wonderful trip, an awesome trip to the Black Hills. Check it out on dirtinmyshoes.com. We've got an itinerary for you for the Black Hills. We cannot wait for you to get out there. It's again, one of our very favorite places to go as a family. There's something for everybody. And so have a great trip to the Black Hills and maybe we'll see you there. We're there all the time. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway, safe travels and we'll see you next week. Thanks for exploring the national parks with us. Please share, like, and subscribe. And if you need any help planning your own trip, click on over to dirtinmyshoes.com. See you next week. Same time, same place. And don't forget to get some dirt in your shoes. Oh,